Welcome to a new edition of the Heat Treat Podcast. Today we have an expert of the heat treatment of the fashion industry, a power player. We got Roman Bau. How's it going, Roman? All the way from Ontario. Good. Uh, <laughs> good. Is it good afternoon for you. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, no problem. Good afternoon. Nice to see you. So we're going to talk about fasteners, right? Uh, you, if you could give us a little summary uh, and explain us what you do, what's your experience on fasteners. Uh, you work on Metex, which is a family company in Canada. And what I understand is it, it is a monster when we're talking about the heat treatment of fasteners. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, my name is Raman Bawa. I'm uh, the general manager of Medex Heat Treating here in um, Brampton, Ontario. We're uh, quite close to Toronto, about 30 minutes uh, west of Toronto. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, Medex Heat Treating um, started in 1983 uh, with one continuous uh, rotary furnace. Um, and at the time, um, obviously before my time, but like, uh, like Carlos had mentioned, it was, uh, a family business. Um, so we, uh, we, my father had worked in previous heat treatment shops and we were doing quite a bit, uh, he was doing quite a bit of fasteners, um, in the Ontario region. Um, and he, when he had decided to start on his own, um, he purchased this one rotary furnace that was running polymer. And we were running um, a wide variety of fasteners. Um, and this furnace at the time was at the extraordinary amount of a thousand pounds per hour. Um, back in 1983, um, from his testament that he says that it was uh, the, one of the largest ones in the, in the province and um, his capacity, no one thought he could ever fill that capacity. So uh, he was running, you know, uh, in Ontario, we have a lot of major manufacturers of fasteners. Um, uh, back in the day, there or and as of recent, there was H. Pollen, um, who were a major manufacturer of fasteners, hardware industry, automotive, um, and still exists to this day, uh, manufacturing as well. Um, but a lot of stuff has changed, and they import a lot of product as well. Um, but in you know back in the 80s and 90s, a lot of product, a lot of fasteners were being manufactured in Ontario. Um, so take it to today, we uh, now operate uh, seven continuous lines. Um, and some three of them are 6,000 pounds per hour, and we fill them to the brim with fasteners um, and all sorts. So we're talking hardware fasteners, automotive fasteners, um, nuts, bolts, uh, rivets, um, you can name it. Some are neutral hardening, some are carburized, some are carbonitrated. Um, obviously, there's a wide array of, array of things that we're doing. Um, and the market in Ontario has changed over the years. Um, obviously, automotive is still large here. Um, general industrial, uh, there's quite a few manufacturers still out here. Um, and of course, they're competing against overseas, but um, we believe with our capacity, we often uh, can help them in that competitive space because we have such large furnaces, we're able to kind of help them in reducing the cost in, in, in manufacturing in North America. So uh, just to have an introduction about fasteners, whenever we, we, we think about heat treat of fasteners, uh, first thing that comes to mind is uh, mesh belts, right? Yes. Uh, but, but, but I believe uh, that may be a misconception in there because uh, one of the things is that you have to choose between uh, uh, IQ or a batch furnace or a mesh belt. That's like the first point of, of how you're going to, uh, where are you going to hit with that or, or which type of furnace? Also, another conception on the industry is that if the volume is not big enough on mesh belts, you can actually lose a lot of money really quick. So mm -hmm. what, what, what's, your, what's your approach on, on, on these two sides? Uh, processing, uh, processing fasteners on IQs or bats, right? And when is like the, the tipping point in order to start processing on the mesh? Well, for us, I mean, as long as I've been here, and that's been about almost 10 years, um, we've never ran fasteners on IQ. Um, and the reason we have always uh, unilaterally stated that is um, quality of product. So from the mesh belt perspective, we believe we have a superior product, uh, quality of metallurgical results from the mesh belt. We have um, a number of systems in place for uniform loading of those mesh belts. And with, those, with that uniform loading, we can ensure that um, we're getting the same property on every piece that we produce. And so when we're talking 
thousands and thousands of pounds, like I said, 6,000 pounds per hour, or, um, you know, any number of that, depending, that load rate obviously varies depending on the type of product. Um, but the consistency and the uniformity of results that we can get from the mesh belt is something that we, we pride ourselves on. And at the same time, I think is expected of, of the fastener industry at this point, because it is such a low cost item, but at the same time, you know, it demands the same, uh, this demands the Consist same consistency, of right? Consistency exactly. of quality. Do you exactly. mention that? Exactly. And so on the batch IQs, um, you know, you have, there's a lot of human error there, right? If you load your baskets too dense, you load your baskets um, non-uniformly, basically, you can have a variation in your hardness results from the center to the edges to the outside. Um, so for fasteners, we've always said because the mesh belts, you can, you have a long period of heat up time before you quench and you are able to automatically uniformly distribute the belt. Um, you'll have the same results for every part. I mean, obviously uniformity aside of the temperature, but you can expect the same results from every load because you put all these processes in place to ensure loading is accurate every single time. Whereas in the batch process, because it's a human process you feel there is times where you could mess it up and you may have you I may have parts coming out of different tolerances so can you briefly explain those uh, a cycle of uh, from the moment we load of well we start to load a furnace because there's also a, a, a key uh, thing of how to load the belt right, right. all, all yeah. the way the, uh, when, when you when, when the part uh, it's it's completely done can you walk through walk us through the the the, the furnace uh itself right, whenever right. You, when, because also uh what's different about fasteners is like when you unload the customer truck right you 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 can you have to be very careful not to because you, you're you're handling a, a bunch of smaller parts right and sometimes whenever we think on heat treat in other parts of the of the world like texas they do big valves or big drills they have to be uh, load one one and in this case we're dealing with thousands or millions of parts that have to be uh, handled on a different way so i believe right. that's the first big difference oh right yeah sorry and exactly that's exactly uh, exactly uh, to your point um we're dealing with truckloads per day so we're dealing with because it's poundage yes you're dealing with millions of parts per day um you know medics ourselves we produce 250,000 to 300,000 pounds of material per day. Um, so it's quite a lot of material coming in and out. And um, because of that, yes, tow motors are of utmost importance. So uh, you just, you, just to interrupt you there, how many pounds uh, you said you, you actually do per day? Uh, 250,000 to 300,000. Have, have you ever done the math on parts? On parts? Uh, not exactly, but- It, it, it uh, will be a huge number, I guess. Like very, very large amount of pieces. Um, the amount of product that flows in and out of here is large, but again, it's screws, nuts, bolts. I mean, we go as big as castings on our new, um, or some casting is from forgings on our continuous belts, but uh, it's a large number of pieces. It's a large number of pieces. Um, and so, yeah, we, we unload the truck um, with tow motors uh, or lift trucks. The lift trucks takes the actual metal bin or the metal container um, and we put it into a bin tipper. The bin tipper loads it into a hopper. Now the hopper has weigh scales. Um, so you have the full load in a hopper, so you know how much your load is. Um, and then through our PLC and our control system, we have a feed rate that we can set. So depending on the furnace it's running on, depending on the type of part it's running on, we establish a feed rate um, and that can be anywhere from 700 pounds an hour to up to 6,000 pounds per hour. Um, and that is based on the part geometry and the type of density you want loading on your belt. So, um, you know, certain parts we can stack up a little bit higher, certain parts we want to be thinner, depending on the geometry, the wall thickness, things like that. Um, so we will, let's say, set for 5,000 pounds per hour. So we enter in our system 5,000 pounds per hour. Um, there are two load scales, like I had mentioned on this hopper, which have uh, vibratory tables. So we put in 5,000 pounds per hour and uh, the computer and the PLC itself figure out, well, 
every 20 to 30 seconds, I need to drop X amount of pounds to make up 5,000 pounds per hour. So it'll drop 30 pounds every 20 seconds, and that will give you the load rate that we're requesting, or it'll change based on that. And because it's not an exact science, it can't drop 20 pounds every time. It may drop 22 pounds, or it may drop 18 pounds. Um, every 20 seconds, it readjusts and gives you an accurate number over the course of an hour to about approximately 5,000 pounds plus minus five pounds. Um, and from there we go through, um, similar to probably in the IQ world where we do a hot water rinse, we wash off any machining oils that have appeared on the, furnace, on the parts, um, any machining oils, any other oils, cold heading, whatever, uh, processing oils that are on the parts. So they're washed with hot water in a dump and spray or dunk and spray washer. Um, and then another vibratory feeder kind of evenly spreads them out onto the belt itself. And that is the entry belt into the hardening zone. Um, and now the hardening furnace, we can adjust the belt speed. We can do things like that. But typically, obviously, we have a 60 minute cycle into the hardening zone. Um, and because the parts have already been pre-weighed and now are being uniformly distributed with a vibratory table. Um, they're entering into the hot zone and it's approximately 60 minutes in the hot zone. Um, well, we're talking for a neutral carburetion cycle, right? Neutral, neutral, neutral right. cycle. Yes. And um, so the conveyor is going along and going along. And at the end of the conveyor, which is not exposed to humans, it's um, inside the furnace, there's a chute that drops down the bottom and they fall off the end of the roller and into the chute. And in that sh at the other end of the chute is the oil tank. And that's where we get our quenching. And so we're continually quenching, you know, the 5,000 pounds per hour or however many pounds per second or 30 seconds it's dropping. Um, and they go into the oil tank and they get quenched. And then we automatically through that oil tank, there's another conveyor that brings the parts out. We go through a post wash where we take all that oil off again. Um, and then again, a drop onto a temper belt and then the temper belt goes through its 60 minute cycle. And at the end of that, we finally go back into the same customer bin that has came to us. So because we have about two and a half hours from start to finish, that bin is emptied, brought to the end of the line and then refilled back up. That's basically, uh, that was a, a mesh belt process, uh, on neutral hardening, just, uh, Describe, on a, I believe you did a great job. A couple of questions um, for you on this on, on this process. So, uh, and, and I seen a couple of shops that had had this pro that this problem that whenever like the parts fall from the hardening furnace to the tank, the, if the parts are not uh, uh, let's if they're very thin or very light, the parts would actually uh, flow uh, on the <laughs> tank. Yeah. Do you, uh, what's your experience on that or what's your advice you can give? I mean, uh, and, and, and second one, right? Uh, because of this, some of you, some users actually use uh, magnetic, magnetic belts, right? right? And, uh, but we had a pre-wash on the, on the beginning of the cycle and then we had a post-wash, right? So how do you handle these, these situations when the parts are really light that uh, whenever they fail on the quench tank and with the agitation, uh, it, it's gonna be like, it, it's gonna create like a tornado part, <laughs> and, and and the rate yeah. that they're gonna come out of the quench tank is gonna be totally different as as, as the rate we actually uh, loading up with the with the feeder, right? Uh, what what what's what's your take on that? Well, for certain light parts, so it, when we're doing neutral hardening, um, certain light parts because you know we can load our belts up to like I said, six thousand pounds per hour. If there's certain light parts and there's not a lot of uh, concerns, you know, we it's hard to say because so certain light parts, obviously we can densely load the belt up to 5,000 pounds, let's say. and But a light part typically would have a thin wall. Um, and if you load too densely, then you will have probably an issue with distortion. And that's just because you'll be packing them onto each other and you may have an issue with distortion. So. Uh, we, I have one example, actually, we, we do a very thin part and we were concerned about the same idea where it might float. Um, we process the parts, we, and actually are still nervous about it to this day. 
Um, but we do eddy current, 100% eddy current sorting on them because of that same idea. Figuring that may, if you may have a floating, uh, one odd floating one that doesn't quench properly, you may get a soft part. So to alleviate it, we actually do um, eddy current sorting on it. But this is a very, very thin wall washer. Actually, I had one at my desk the other day because that uh, right here, actually. And this is what I'm talking about. And this is. Yeah, that's very thin. That's very thin. Yeah, uh, I think we're talking about three millimeters, maybe, maybe even two and a half. And we're talking about. Uh, 10 millimeter diameter so that, that um, will float with the turbulence on the tank right exactly exactly so this is something that we actually eddy current 100 because we are nervous about it um but typically this is not a common product for us so it's not a huge concern um but something like this you know because again this is an automotive uh, uh stamping um because we're so nervous about it and because automotive demands such high quality um you know, we would obviously caution any customer to say that, well, we would need to uh, eddy current it. Um, but typically the fastener world, you have enough mass where it will fall to the bottom. Um, the mesh belts that we run, I know there's a wide variety of them, um, but uh, the ones that we use, we have agitation through an agitation pump, not an agitation propeller. Okay. Um, so sometimes the propellers, we've heard of things getting stuck in there and adding to that, um, we find with the agitation pumps, so basically very, very large horsepower pumps that are continually pushing the oil around, um, kind of aid in that as well. Um, that's been my experience, at least for that. Um, light parts are tricky and there are things to be concerned about, but typically the things we're running on our mesh belts have been, um, have been heavy enough that we haven't had an issue. Actually, some of the lighter parts, what we would do is run them in uh, in our IQs. And what we would do instead in that case is we, if we even concerned about floating there, we we have a piece of actually old mesh belt that we put on top. And that kind of helps weigh them down. And we use that as a kind of a quenching <laughs> way of quenching it to kind of make sure that nothing will float and you don't have any of those stragglers. Um, you were mentioning something about magnetic belts. Um, yeah. We um, we actually don't have any magnetic belts, but we know certain. You, you, you do not. No, nothing is magnetic in our place. Um, big thing that we've heard, and that, not in my experience, and probably prior to my my experience at Medix, um, is uh, a lot of jam ups in the quench because the quench is full of oil and it's continually being fed with parts. If things were to get caught somewhere below there, and uh, and for whatever reason, that magnet is holding onto it and not allowing it to come up. You can eventually get a big pile of parts in that magnetic quench. Um, so we've always been against it. Um, and I know a few of my colleagues around the world have uh, had magnetic quenches and have actually switched them out because of that, because they see there is validity in it when you can actually access the tanks or actually access the conveyors, but a quench tank that's submerged in oil at high temperatures that can only be accessed when you actually bring down the furnace and cool everything down and pump the oil out um, makes a maintenance nightmare for most people. Yeah, uh, this is, this is uh, kind of a follow-up question. I also uh, read on your CV that you're responsible for the maintenance of, of, of the of the equipment, right? Well, well amongst uh, others, but yes, yes, of course. Well, but but uh, in, in this case, when, whenever we're talking about a continuous furnace, which I mentioned the mesh built is, right? And when you have a, a bunch of uh, throughput to process, right? Uh, and and such a mixture of parts. Whenever you shut down the furnace for maintenance, and and I don't know if you drain the tank out, do you find a bunch of uh, remains <laughs> in there? <laughs> um, it probably worse before, but we've done a lot of little tweaks to the furnaces to ensure mm -hmm. that we we don't get a lot of stuff built up. Of course, well, you, are... you, you, you get some, but uh, I, I I I put you on the spot. Sorry about that. No, right? no, no, not uh, a problem. Um, but it, it, it's a it's a common uh, uh, it, it's it's a, a nature of the process. You know, oh, you're gonna 100%. have remains there because you're push you're 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 pushing a bunch of stuff over there that it's falling into a quench tank with turbulence, right? And exactly. some things are gonna float, they're gonna bounce, they're gonna wherever, right? But at exactly. the very the, uh, that makes sense that you tell because the, the mesh build I I used to run it had propellers, right? Yeah. Don't want, and and. <laughs> They, the stuff can actually get caught on the mechanics on, of a propeller. 
Of course, of course, yeah. And so similar, I mean, yeah, you do see lots of buildup uh, as, you know, obviously as much as we can minimize it, we do, but that is a common maintenance item that we need to take care of. Um, and we have our period, we have periods that we've set up that we have to shut down, empty out the oil, um, physically get inside, clean out what we can, ensure no jam ups. Um, and it's part of the preventative maintenance because, and, and that that's kind of the, the, I mean, the beauty of mesh belts is you can run large amounts of product and continually and nonstop, but uh, the maintenance has to be taken into account. And when you are down, it is days um, and uh, a lot of invasive work needs to happen with oil being removed, um, physically getting in there, getting into, getting into pits, getting um, all sorts of things like that. So yeah. It's a, it is a maintenance item, a big maintenance item for sure. In your experience, what's the percentage you believe uh, is the utilization percentage to uh, break even on a mesh belt? When is, if you don't have the right volume, when, when does it not make sense to run a mesh belt? When you're below 70%, 80%, because this, this coming comes across a lot of heat triggers, hmm. right? That uh, if you have a bunch of, of, uh, of volume, the mesh belt is the way to go, but you have to be very careful about mm, if, if you're not hitting breaking uh, mm -hmm. break even, uh, you're burning money. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, fortunately, I guess uh, we've been in a unique position where we've never been uh, had that much excess capacity where we've had to make that decision whether to shut down or not. Um, we've been fortunate where we've had enough work kind of to always sustain a full mesh belt. Um, what we are, and I mean, I'm only speaking from my experience here. Um, sure. What we, what, what our kind of scheduling is, is, and we intend, we always run everything seven days. So that's kind of how we do things here. Um, because of the nature of scaling, the furnaces up and down are so tough on continuous lines, um, getting carbon potential, things like that take quite a while because you have such a large area. Um, so to heat it up, is you know 10 to 12 hours and then once you get temperature you're talking about um, another six eight hours to get carbon potential so we intend to run our thing seven days um, if we if we can't run it seven days in the case that you're saying where we don't have enough product to run um, we ensure we have enough for five days um, and then we can take the weekends off on certain pieces of equipment but our big lines we try to run um, seven days um, the break even point I mean, even just breaking it down with you kind of in person is, you know, the beauty of mesh belts is typically you only need two operators. So you need one in the front, one in the back, depending on the size. So a thousand pounds per hour. I mean, I, you know, just to talk through it a little bit in our case, a customer bin or a, a bin that we process is um, a thousand pounds. So if you're running six, 5,000 pounds per hour, that's finishing in 20 minutes. So you need somebody there loading every 20 minutes and you need somebody at the back end unloading for every 20 minutes um, so your labor is two people if you're running a thousand pound belt you're probably running at 80 percent. so you're running at 800 pounds per hour um, so depending on your load size that's one hour one person can run the front one person can run the back uh, or so the same person can do both sides um, so labor wise they are efficient um, but it is really the nature of the product if you have enough product um, to sustain it for at least five days, it should be profitable because, and again, of course, what you charge for it, but uh, in the fastener industry, um, that's where volume makes sense, at least in our experiences. If you can, you know, a thousand pounds in fastener world is not enough when somebody, for instance, one of our customers makes 80,000 pounds of fasteners per day, and they, that's, basically uh, a, a full day of production and on one of our lines. So, um, you know, that, that's where the economics play in and that's where we're always evaluating it. But um, we've never, uh, the, you know, the only fasteners right now that we run on our batch IQs are actually quite long fasteners. Up, uh, mm -hmm. We do eight inch to 24 inch fasteners um, that are actually racked vertically. And that's also because of bending and distortion. Um, but yeah, the economics, um, you know, I haven't explored it enough to know where you would, you know, we've always typically run on our IQs, we run transmission, stampings, 
fine blank, things that are of distortion concern and that need to be handled very well, or long carburizing times or long carb, usually long carburizing cycles. Um, but yeah, no, I, you know, interesting to think what, uh, where that break even runs. I mean, honestly, from my perspective is the, the amount of work you have is really what dictate that if I can produce it, sure. I, you know, if I can produce this many pounds per hour versus I can produce this many pounds per hour on a batch IQ and, you know, batch IQ, you can only what do 3000 pounds and that's minus a fixture still. So you're talking about 2000 pounds and that's still a three hour cycle. So yeah, ah, I could probably write this out and get the numbers. But <laughs> oh, totally. I mean, it's uh, yeah, I hope it, uh, it makes sense for you next next time we speak. And going to uh, another subject, another question that I hear a lot whenever we're talking about mesh belts, it's carburizing. You mentioned you do carburizing, and you do mention uh, you did mention that you you do some carbonite charting for parts, right? Yep. I met uh, people that said, you know. Uh, carburizing on mesh belts is not the best option because parts can get overstacked and they won't get uh, the, the case depth that uh, they require. That's like the most common uh, comment I get about uh, carburizing on mesh belts, which will also apply to carbon nitride, right? Because we're going to get a layer of nitride on, on nitrides right. on, uh, on the parts. So uh, what would be your answer to to those guys that actually? Uh, well, it that's that's an effect that happens, right? Yeah. yeah well, what, 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 what's your opinion on that? How how do you ensure uh, make sure that the part got the necessary case depth in the case the parts actually st uh, stack on top of each other? Right. So for carburizing and carbon nitriding, same idea. We um, it is very part specific. So. Um, typically what we're doing, uh, well, we have a variety, wide variety of parts that we're doing carburizing and carbon nitriding on the mesh belts. Um, you know, the common ones are, uh, are stampings. So stampings, fine blank parts. So typically they're flat. Um, we adjust our, our feed rate accordingly. So a 6,000 pound per hour furnace on neutral hardening for carbon nitriding or carburizing is running approximately 800 to 1100 pounds per hour at that point. So we've drastically reduced our load rate at that point so that we ensure we're not having too, too tall of a stack of parts. Um, and we're doing our best so that they're not nesting. Um, and if they are going to nest, uh, we try to obviously do it with some, you know, some thought process beforehand that if we can't avoid a certain amount of nesting, you know, some of these parts have gear teeth that obviously that's the reason they're being carburized is that those teeth are the ones that they need to have that wear resistance on. Um, so what we're intending to do is just make sure that in those critical areas that are of, of actual, you know, of importance on that part, ensuring that we're not going to be nesting and masking those areas, but we kind of play with both. So we make sure our feed rate is low. Um, we, you know, we're looking at actually the geometry and seeing where we can kind of utilize it. So back to kind of the economics of it, running at 900 to 1,000 pounds per hour on a mesh belt versus running it on an IQ, um, we've found in our experience that the economics still work in favor of the mesh belt, just because the nature of the amount, especially in the stampings, um, because it's such a high volume product. Um, IQ time we find is very labor intensive. Um, you know, it is. So we, pretty much exactly. directly it's exactly and so we can offset that by running a reduced road rate but with only two operators again so it kind of that's where our economics always usually tend to to favor um another product that we run i guess i should also mention uh, a lot of on carburized on mesh belts is uh, machine products and so mm -hmm. these are machine shafts um blocks things like that connectors items like that and the reason those same idea is they don't we can actually run those at a little bit higher feed rates because they don't nest onto each other um and these furnaces are designed again for six thousand pounds per hour so you have a lot of area to spread a lot of gas around um when I, I, let me let me interrupt you there whenever we talk about six thousand pounds per hour uh let's let just make let's let just make things clear when whenever you run ultra hardening cycle you typically you want to have the load inside the furnace for 60, 60 minutes an hour, let's say, right? right? But whenever you run a carburizing cycle, we're, we're talking about four 
to six or to eight hours. So no, that, that, no. no? So in our case, um, depending again. Well, depending know, on the case, right? But you, you have to have case. you have to have a, a, a heater ramp, a soaking, and a diffusion, exactly. uh, and, and a diffusion phase, which which makes uh, three to four zones, right? Or, right. Or, or, so, so so the carburizing it's a little uh, more time intensive than neutral hardening. Would that uh, be a right assumption? So again, we're playing again with time, temperature, and load rates here. So we've reduced our load rate drastically. So the heat time. The, again, like to your point, uh, the furnaces are designed for 6,000 pounds of hour for heat recovery. So if I fed 6,000 pounds, the burner should be able to get them to temperature within X amount of time and have enough time for them to soak and quench. Um, so if we drop that down to 1,000 pounds, so a sixth of its capacity, those parts heat up fairly instantly. Um, and now we're allowed to hold the temperature. Now our gas composition for the atmosphere obviously is enriched in carbon. Um, the cases that we're dealing with um, on uh, carburizing on the mesh belt, they vary. Uh, a typical one that we run quite often, um, you know, in thousands of an inch we run, we call it file hard, I guess an old term, but five to 10 thou, five to 15 thou. Um, and those ones are typically 60 minutes. You can get your case fairly quickly Okay. and run those within 60 to 75 minutes in the hardening zone. Um, another one we run, uh, and again, I'm just thinking a customer, so I'm not doing the conversion, but 15 mil 0.15 millimeters to 0.35 millimeters. Um, those we, you know, we can run in 80 minutes and we'll, we'll be able to obtain the case. We can slow down our mesh belts to a maximum of weeks. We do it in minutes, but 180 minutes, so three hours. So the belt will actually travel at three, uh, up to the, I mean, take three hours to traverse the hot zone. And um, again, so you have three hours where the belt's moving that slowly, and then you also can adjust your feed rate accordingly. So those two together, we can usually find a happy medium to obtain the right case and alleviate a lot of the massing concerns that are, uh, that are present with that. So, uh, and that applies pretty much to carbon nitrogen as well, right? Similar, exactly. Similar. Exactly. Do, do you run endo or uh, natrium metal? Uh, we run endo. Endo. Is that, is that typical in Canada? Uh, yeah, there are a few nitrogen methanol people around still. Uh, most are endo. Most are endo. Oh. Okay. And uh, as a second subject, which because, because mostly on, on, on the show, on the podcast, we have had guests that uh, run uh, IQs or pushers, right? Right. Uh, or, or, or bigger parts. And what big part when you run automotive is to have traceability per part. We talked about CQI9 per part, but you have to do the surveys. But in this case, we're dealing with millions and millions of parts. We're dealing with lots here, right? Yep. Uh, uh, what, what's, uh, how do you uh, do the traceability on, uh, on the parts? Because you also run IQs, you mentioned. And right. I believe uh, I, I have... Uh, some experience with uh, CQ and nano fasteners, and they ask for an infrared, which like it's like the big thing, the big difference you have. Okay. But uh, pretty much besides that, everything is the same. But okay. you're running uh, thousands or even millions of parts. How, how do you trace that? <laughs> um, it's if, if you're running, if you're running automotive, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we mostly run automotive. Uh, about eighty percent is automotive. Um, typically. Uh, similar, you know, probably to a lot of people, it's all about control systems and computers. So, um, you know, we have a MedEx job number that's attached to every bin or lot number. So, um, you know, some customers who are making nuts, for instance, they may make one lot number for 12,000 pounds. So we'll run, we'll create one MedEx number, job number for that 12,000 pounds. Um, and then we trace everything with that job number. So we know the time that it went in the furnace, the time that it left the furnace into the oil, the time it entered the temper, and the time that it exited the temper. And that's how we maintain tra traceability at every moment. And then when we do our entry into the furnace, that job number is attached to it. And so that's how we kind of keep all of our charts and things in order that we can able to, if somebody were to give us a job number or their lot number or their PO number, 
we were able to pull all those records. And like you said, IR is a big thing for continuous lines. So um, pull the IR records and be able to say, well, this was run at this time. These were the temperatures. This was, you know, we're trending uh, endo flow. We're trending belt speed. We're trending um, natural gas flow. Obviously, we're trending um, a wide variety of parameters that we right. can always go back and look at. TCs and everything. TCs, carbon potential, um, uh, you know, belt uh, fan failures. We're monitoring current on, on fans and all the recirculation right. fans and temper fans. And, um, and you would do it, but, but you do it per lot or, uh, and then when it becomes to the lab testing, what, what's, what's the standard of, of uh, how, many, how many parts you have to take uh, and do a metallurgical testing and what, what, what's the standard there? So we because do, someone's... sorry, go ahead. Uh, I mean, uh, just referring to the difference as well. Whenever we have a big oh. part, the guys go like, well, you can only destroy one, right? <laughs> we, 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 we talked uh, with Hedro Falcon uh, and, uh, around uh, a month ago and she said, you know, I cannot uh, destroy a part because everything's aerospace, everything's defense, everything's yeah. space exploration, right? So uh, what, what's like the standard practice when we have the opposite, sure. which tons and tons, I mean, you can destroy a bunch of bolts and nuts, I guess, uh, and get the result, but how do you, when you're processing uh, those lots, maybe on hours, right? Yeah, so yeah. The, 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 there can be a big differentiation from the first uh, batch of the load, right? And eight, hour, eight hours after that, you can have a different uh, process variable that went bad, a thermocouple that, that broke, maybe a probe that failed, right? How, how do you address those lots that started good and maybe there was a breakdown in the middle of the lot, but the first 50% of it was a good lot, right? How, right. I just want to understand the standard procedure. So, I mean, um, probably similar to a lot of people, we do in-process checks. So first is um, from hardening, we do uh, checks after while they're coming out of quench. And our standard procedure is to check the start of the batch, the middle, and the end. So if it's 10,000 pounds, we're checking um, 10 pieces in the front, 10 pieces in the middle, 10 pieces in the end. And that's at a quench. Um, so that's done by the operators themselves. Um, and that is the intent to just to really decipher if there's a problem with the steel or not. So if you're getting results that are wildly out of range for a 10 B 21 material, um, that's a time that we can identify that and say, well, this is not going to be the right or variations of steel, right? So, you know, within the 10 B21 family is this is going to be higher carbon or lower carbon or 1022 steel for whatever reason and it's lower carbon. Um, that gives them a chance to kind of identify all those issues. Um, and then we do the same thing at final. So after quench, they now go into the washer, the temper. Um, and then at temper, the operators do again another 10, 10, 10. And then final inspection is the same thing. Um, and that's done by the quality lab and same thing. Section the parts. We're checking the hardness in the middle. And this is for neutral hardening, obviously, mm -hmm. depending on the case. Um, and then, yeah, if you do recognize an issue, we have contingency plans and, and strategic plans here. There is a way where we can isolate parts. So we have tracking of parts based on time from the computer. So I enter, you know, I, I'm loading 10,000 pounds into the furnace. I can tell where the parts are in the furnace based on part tracking, um, based on our PLC system. So if we know that we see something happened in zone two, we can allow the parts from zone three to quench and everything after that point, we can say now put this all on hold and then disposition it after or things like that. So we have accurate um, part tracking on our systems that we can actually say, well, these parts were up to this point and we can disposition some of these or we can disposition all of them depending on the case. But because of that part tracking from our PLC, we we're able to really de decipher where things were in the furnace and where they were at that time. Well, what's another, what would you say are like the main misconceptions whenever we talked about fasteners or uh, mesh belts uh, or, uh, or what are the key items that you really have to watch that most people don't watch? Uh, because you're an expert on fasteners, right? Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and there are many companies, hit with shops, that they might be experts on many things, but not fasteners itself. And they might not like uh, 
have as much uh, as much exposure as you do as all these uh, different things that we talked about, like you know the flooring of the parts or or, or you know the ten ten procedure that you just gave us. Right. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things. I guess you know a misconception really, I think, is uh, and it, I mean you know my experience. I started off. Um, as an electrical engineer, not knowing anything about uh, heat treating when I joined. I mean, I had experience as I grew up, but, uh, you know, you know, really getting into it and uh, understanding things. Um, you know, understanding what a major problem and a minor problem is on a continuous okay, line is, uh, is something that always is, um, is uh, something that you have to understand and be able to digest. And because there's so many things that can go wrong with a continuous line, um, being able to really triage them and prioritize them in your mind as to what needs to be addressed today, what needs to be addressed before the weekend, before this, because there are so many moving parts and I'm sure all heat treaters say this, but same thing in a, in a continuous line, it doesn't stop. So, you know, it, it's running seven days a week. There's things going in and out 24 seven. So, Things happen overnight. Things happen um, on the weekends, and you just have to. You have to. I I personally used to get very frustrated when to know that these things were happening, like little things that just kind of start to build up to a bigger issue. So, just being able to really digest and understand all that information, and you know, be proactive and be practical about the fixes that you need to make um, to ensure that you're going to get quality product, but at the same time, you can maintain your uptime. And yeah, similar to kind of what we were talking about the economics is uptime of the continuous lines is, is important. It is important to cycle those things up and down is a huge endeavor. And it takes, you know, six people to always just always be around it and to ensure that it's going to get to temperature properly and get your carbon potential properly. Um, that is really the, the, the one of them. And the other one I'm sure comparatively to IQs is you know, the scale is larger, right? You know, in an IQ, you have up to six, uh, six tubes, you know, on a continuous line on one of them, we have 32 tubes, I think. And the other ones we have 24 tubes. So, you know, when you're trying to get carbon potential and one tube is leaking and you can't see it, whereas in an IQ, you can see the six and you maybe will see that hole, um, to not be able to see where this leak is coming from and your carbon potential is just erratic is, um, it's frustrating, but it's part of it. I think that uh, you just, all minds get put together as to how can we decipher this problem and diagnose it to make sure that we don't actually have to bring the furnace completely cold. Because once we bring it cold- Oh yeah, yeah. That, so that's, that, that's like a looser, right? Exactly, exactly. And that could be five days, easily five days. So you just, it really is paramount is keeping up time. And I think that is the mantra of medics and that's always in the mantra of medics. And, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, I, I've only learned from that. So that's kind of where my, my experience kind of lies is keeping and things running. And, and especially uh, foreigners like to fail uh, fr Friday evenings when you already have dinner reservations. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. Yeah, never, they, so, you know, it, it's, it's never on their working hours. You always care have to about be, your social life. Uh, yeah, yeah of, of, <laughs> of the watch, right. <laughs> Rame, it, it, it's it's been uh, uh, great talking to you about uh, fasteners. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, this is a very uh, broad topic, but you know, uh, I believe you gave us uh, the basics, the one-on-one, -on -one, right? Because the mission of this podcast is to uh, have the very experts on the subject delivering the the, yeah. the experience you have gained, right? Uh, anything else on 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 running fasteners that uh, you, you would like to share with the audience that we might have missed? Um, no. We, we, I... we talk about we talk about the basics, the, the you know the the, the furnace through the, the furnace pad. We talk about maintenance. We talk about the quality checks. Uh, we we talk very briefly about CQNN, which like the big thing is is like the IR, the the the, the infrared. Uh, uh, did we miss something that uh, you think it's important that we need to address? Um, well, and I'm sure similar to for a lot of people's experience, but fasteners, the material selection in the fastener world is um, uh, from our customers or from our experience of our customers is is very few types of steels, right? And you have, you know, mostly it's in the 10 series and you're talking something between 
10, 10 to 10, 45 and the maximum. Um, you know, something that I've learned and I mean, maybe common to most metallurgists, but just the, the grades of steel vary so much. And that really dictates, you know, continuous lines, what we love about them as well. And things that we, we've probably stretched them further than faster is because of the benefits of of the the quickness to quench right so you have a continuous belt that falls directly and falls into oil so you know your time to quench is very few seconds um, and so we often run more stampings and things like that and we, we leverage our continuous belt for that way um, and sometimes the you know the 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 lower grades of steel like a 10 10 we can quench out fine and we we can give people what they need or a 1018 we can give them what they need but just you know just understanding the material selection and why customers or whoever your customer is who's using that material is really really helps to dictate our process you know if there is um you know that's just just kind of as a general statement i'd say it's just very important that we we understand the material what is being selected you know and we have things like you know and similar some some things are made with the uh, steel that hasn't been shaved or things like that, where you have decarb. Um, so really understanding the material selection is really important, I think, before we start running high volume of product. And for 60, 70% of the fasteners, most people select is very good steel that is very well quenched. Um, but, you know, some of the smaller customers and they're always trying to find different things and different materials. And so, you know, the, the continuous lines have a great ability for that quick quench to be able to get you the great hardness results that are from a lot of steels, but uh, some of the poorer steels, you know, you just got to be really, really cognizant of, and you may have inconsistent results and, you know, a, a material that has a large variability in terms of its carbon content or in its alloys um, really plays a big part in your process and can cause you a lot of headaches. Realistically, at, in the end of the day, we're all trying to provide this as a service. And so you can only do you can only do good work if you're only giving good products. So I think that really, I mean, that's a big lesson I learned is you know understanding what we're treating and understanding more than just you know this is the grade, but understanding how they make it, what is the intent behind it, what is the work, the the, the application behind it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, one one uh, thought just can come to come to my mind when you say types of steel. Well, we didn't touch much on the distortion subject, which I believe is also a big thing uh, when, when dealing with such a different variety of steels and part numbers, right? Uh, it, it, what, what's the distortion, uh, let's, let's say, spectrum that, that, that you experience when dealing with different types of steel, different types of part, different types of applications? You mentioned fastener, you mentioned stamping, you mentioned uh, machining parts, machine parts. Uh, but oh, it always the distortion is like the big headache of all heat treaters. No matter if you run right. a faster, no matter if you run a vacuum furnace, no matter if you run, let's say, uh, IQs or, or pit furnaces. Uh, what, what, what's your uh, what's your experience with distortion mesh belts? Um, I, 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 I no, let me tell you because I, I, I have talked with, all, with several uh, friends of mine that actually do, do uh, mesh belts, and I, I found one really. Uh, that I never watched that they call mesh belt on a racking, racking of the parts. They do some racking okay. of fasteners, right? And they actually rack on a mesh belt, and 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 it's it's like a little, uh, it's like wire, right? Yep. And they rack the parts, and 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 the rack falls on the tank with the parts, and and but the part went through the. The, the the foreigners racked right yeah yep. is, is that something that you see or do you do <laughs> um you know it's it, we, that was we, unique to me when i saw it yeah I mean, I, yeah we've done it for not for fasteners but we've done it for um fine blank parts fine blank uh, right yeah, fine blank parts so fine blank i mean that's the biggest thing with fine blank parts distortion 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 how can we minimize distortion and keep the cost low, right? So mm -hmm. um, we do a bunch of fine blank parts on our continuous line that we we feed regular through the hopper. Uh, we do a bunch of fine blank parts that we actually um, individually load piece by piece on the mesh belt. 
and uh, and sometimes we actually orient them so you know tabs out tabs in different things like that and i don't know if it provides better distortion or more repeatable distortion and i think that really um from my experience has always been it's not that it's tremendously better it's just so consistent that they're able to um able to compensate for it in their tooling design at the in prior to heat treatment or an after whatever that may be um but yeah the racking on belt we've done some trials we've done some experiments that's um, very that, that thing is very labor expensive uh, you know exactly. labor expensive right intensive and, and my in the economics that i've run i usually find that it's more expensive than running it on iqs because I find that yes, you can run more parts at a time, but the amount to keep up with my belt is more is a lot more people to my belts are big. My you know I can run a lot of product through them, and you're so an army. exactly. And so I you can know, buy, you, you, you know running twenty four seven just and, and just 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 keep just keep moving exactly. So I can you know from our perspective, it, our belts are better, better utilized for mass product rather than individual product because you're now wasting more time not running as much product and the economics don't really work for us um one thing that is of interest of especially of fasteners um you know like i said we run um long fasteners short fasteners so the idea of presenting those fasteners to quench um you know anything above six inches seven inches we we don't rack them but we really ensure our loading on the vibratory side into the quench is very particular and ensure that we again repeatable results right it's not so much we can we can alleviate any of those concerns but to ensure that we have repeatable results so the customer can at least anticipate what we're doing and if something's out of the norm um that's something else we can respond to fantastic thanks for that for sharing all this uh, knowledge that you have with us uh, now let's move on to uh, my favorite part of the interview uh, right now because uh Life hacks and gadgets are <laughs> such a trendy uh, subject with the new generation. So do you have a heat treat hack or a heat treat gadget that you would like to share with the audience? Um, yeah, I was trying to think about this one. I mean, I'm, honestly, my simplest thing is a flashlight. I have a very, very high powered flashlight and I use that to look inside the furnace. Like, like in with the mesh belts, you have 40 foot chambers. So we're we can lift the flaps up and you know we can take a Lego high powered flashlight and look inside and see what's actually happening um, love the gadget love the that, gadget that's it that's all we really got you know, you know we have had in the show a bunch of hacks but uh you're the first one to come with a gadget <laughs> uh, right so, <laughs> yeah that's the simplest so, thing i got that's the one that we keep in our pockets at all times and that helps yeah figure everything out fantastic fa fantastic thanks for sharing that and no problem. And, and moving on to uh, to for the closure of the show, and um, you, you know, I'm 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 pretty sure that uh, you're a successful guy, and you have you're gonna be ten times more successful if you keep doing what you're doing. Which, Thank you. you know, Hopefully, I, I with, with this uh, with this call, you know, I, I I have a very very high opinion why you do. You are an expert on the subject, and uh, I believe it's your passion as well, right? Yeah, of and, course. And uh, it. On, on a more human side, an added value, we, because we talk a lot of technicalities on the, sh on the show, right? But uh, I believe in hard work myself, right? But I, I believe you also have to have a plan or a vision. And when you're, you're very young and you go uh, to find a new job, no matter if you went to college or not, right? And and you come on this industry that hits metal and, and pour it, pour it the metal and quench uh, you know, it's, it, it's heat treat, right? Uh, and it's not a fancy industry, right? If, if you compare it to startups, everybody wants to work on Instagram now or on Amazon, right? <laughs> but what would you say to that guy that uh, just got offered uh, to be uh, responsible for the heat treat or for the heat treat shop, let's say at General Motors or, or uh, somebody's trying to hire him on, on, on a commercial heat treat? Uh, what will be a, a personal experience or advice that you would like to share with the new generations of, of, of uh, heat treaters, right? Uh, that you have learned through your entire career. It doesn't have to be technical, right? Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, what, 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 what would you like to share with the audience? 
Um, yeah, just having natural curiosity about what we're doing. Um, I mean, you know, as you mentioned, it's not a very sexy industry. It's, um, you know, in the end of the day, exactly what it is, we're heating steel and we're cooling it as fast as we can and hoping we get something good out of it. But, um, you know, part of my, my experience, again, coming from, uh, you know, I was electrical engineer, had no real experience in heat treatment, and then kind of coming in here in a role to try to kind of take this and, and grow this business further. Um, yeah, having a natural curiosity about the, the products that you're treating, understanding the applications of it. Um, you know, I, I'm a technical person, but I'm also not a technical person. You know, I'm, I'm not a metallurgist. I don't understand how they make the steel. I get it to an, an, a degree, but not a whole lot. But, uh, you know, because we're highly automotive and highly, well, a general industry as well, just understanding where the part is coming from, who's making it, and then seeing where it actually ends up, um, you know, transmission parts, you get to see, you know, and similar, we have parts that and then, I mean, other curiosity that I've just general myself is just understanding the supply chain has been astronomical to understand that parts, you know, sometimes it, get made in. It, it, it is amazing that it's it's amazing. to understand supply chain. Right? Yeah, it comes from Taiwan, it gets heat treated in Toronto, it gets sent to Mexico, then it comes back to Windsor. I mean, right. it's unbelievable. And to just see the amount of people that are involved with it. Um, and then you finally get to touch it and you get to put your personal touch on it. And, you know, I mean, we, I personally take a lot of pride in the fact to know that I know there's vehicles out there that have parts that have been run at Medex. And I, I think that curiosity about those, uh, those items can really invigorate that spirit of heat treating because yes, it's not sexy, but it is critical and there is a lot of things depending on it. So, and, and I tell this to people, we might not be in a sexy industry as the fashion industry or, or but this industry is very interesting, right? Yeah. It's made you think, it makes, it makes you a problem solver and, and you get exposed to the supply chain, right? Yeah. And, and talking to some guys, uh, we might even do some rocket science, right? Yeah. Uh, there's fasteners that might go on, uh, on, uh, on the space program, right? So yeah, exactly. that's what we do to make the world better, right? So we, we, we might not be, uh, let's say, on the sport industry, which is a little more fancier, but, you know, uh, our, our industry is super uh, interesting. And I, I, I really like to see uh, the expression of the faces when I actually did because but, but you actually explain this with a big smile on your face, right? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know you noticed that. So yeah, that, that, that actually expresses your passion. Whenever you're yeah. talking about what you do, right? And sure. and I believe that's like the that that's what that that's our goal. That's how we want to get uh, to smile. This new engineer that he just got uh, you know promoted to run the heat, the, the heat treat shop. Yeah, right. Well, so I think this podcast is a good way to showcase that. I think it uh, yeah definitely can have people have some pride in what they're doing. Yeah, I think that's the that's the important part of it all. Yeah. Well, Roman, uh, thank you very much for your time. No I, I did learn a lot. I do appreciate this. Uh, yeah, I hope whenever the travel restrictions are over, you know, if I'm around Toronto, I would love to uh, uh, buy you dinner and just keep talking about your passion, which is the heat industry. <laughs> and you can give me sure. a, couple of, a couple of hints, yeah, right? Please. And uh, just would like to say where we have a weekly podcast on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Spotify. If you, if you want to work out and listen to a podcast, you can actually listen it on Spotify. Uh, do me a favor, Roman, and go like this. And we're going to have subscribe <laughs> to the channel. Um, here's the link. Hit like, and we'll see you next week on another episode of the Hitfit Podcast. It was Roman Bawa. Thank you, guys. Take care.